I want to introduce our first speaker today. Dr. Don Frazier is the director of the Texas Center at Shriner University in Kerrville. He is a graduate of the University of Texas at Arlington and TCU. Frazier is an award-winning author of six books on the Civil War, including Blood and Treasure, Cotton Clads, Fire in the Cane Fields, um, I lost my place, hmm. Blood on the Bayou and Tempest Over Texas. His other works include serving as co-author of Frontier Texas, Historic Abilene, and The Texas You Expect, as well as general editor of the U.S. and Mexico at War, and a collection of letters published as Love and War, The Civil War Letters and Medicinal Book of Augustus V. Ball. I've read that. That is really a good book. Now, Frazier has taught in college classrooms at TCU, McMurray, and Shriner University. And in addition to his classroom teaching, Don has, a very, has been very involved in public history, working on Civil War and Frontier Heritage Trails in Texas, New Mexico, and Louisiana, and work on historical projects in Europe and Mexico. In 1995, Dr. Frazier helped found the McWinney Group, a Texas-based 501c3 nonprofit that operates an educational adventure enterprise, Bear Leader Tours. Also, State House Press, a publishing imprint and consortium with Texas A&M University and online education efforts. Dr. Frazier is an elected member of the prestigious Philosophical Society of Texas, the oldest learned organization in the state. He's a fellow of the Texas State Historical Association and a director scholar on the board of the Texas Historical Foundation. He is also an advisor for the Alamo, which we need very much these days, the State Board of Education, and Governor Abbott recently appointed him to the advisory committee for the Texas 1836 project. Now today, Dr. Frazier will lead off our symposium with his exciting presentation of Tempest Over Texas. Don, let's give him a great welcome here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm glad to not be staring at the uh, projector anymore. <laughs> I was about to tell you all my secrets. Uh, so I used to be in the uh, college classroom, and when I went to Shriner, the uh, president down there said, all right, you are no longer faculty. I said, oh my gosh, this is a major tragedy. I've been faculty my whole life. You know, how can I not be on the faculty side of this equation? I said, well, you're an administrator now. So uh, those of you that are in higher education understand what that means. It's going to the dark side. <laughs> and he said, but if it'll assuage your anxiety any, I need you to think about what you're really doing now. He says, you are, in the old days, you used to teach 18 to 21 year olds and you would teach them in a room that was about 20 by 30, and there'd be 20 disinterested kids in that, uh, in that space. I said, yeah, that's pretty much it. He says, well, you've got a new classroom now. It is 254 counties large with 30 million pupils. Go to work. <laughs> so y'all are my class, and I will uh, attempt to not abuse you the material today can sometimes be a bit of a slog, and I'll try to keep it all straight for you. There's a lot of moving parts. It's a complicated story. Uh, the Texas Center welcomes y'all anytime you're in Kerrville. I look forward to seeing you down there. There's plenty of good things to uh, eat in Kerrville, plenty of cool things to see in Kerrville, and a fascinating Civil War story down in the Hill Country that I'll be happy to share with you when you come by. So don't be a stranger. All right, today though, it's Tempest Over Texas, and this is book four in what started out as my Louisiana quadrille, which seems to be morphing into a little longer series than I expected. Louisiana is a complicated place, and when you're coming from Texas, sometimes it can 
seemed to be a little uh, hard to understand. <laughs> so fortunately, I have friends in Louisiana that explained it for me. I said, look, Louisiana's easy to understand. It all centers on Alec. And if you say Alec instead of Alexandria, that means you're part of the cool kids. So it's all centered on Alec. North of Alec, they butter their rice. South of Alec, it's dirty rice. That's Louisiana. All right. So Alec's going to come up in this uh, conversation. So first of all, what do you do when you have assembled a very large army in the Mississippi Valley that finds itself unemployed after the fall of Vicksburg and Port Hudson? And of the two, I still think Port Hudson was the more important in terms of strategy and location, but that's a conversation for a different day. But a nod to my friend from Baton Rouge. All right, what you do is you apply those troops towards the big campaigns that are going on back east. And both Ulysses Grant and Nathaniel P. Banks down in New Orleans, Grants and Vicksburg, both agreed that what we ought to do is we ought to go knock off Mobile. It should be a cinch, easily done. Let's cut through the heartland. That's the black belt of Mississippi and Alabama and into Georgia. Let's go in there and part of the whole vibe in 1863 is to physically remove the enslaved population from the places where they are enslaved, force the men into the army, send the women and children into relocation camps, uh, use that labor to reassign it to government leased plantations. That's the Confederate heartland if in fact you're going to try to upend slavery. That's the way you go. You coordinate with Rosecrans coming out of Tennessee. You lock in Bragg's army somewhere in North Georgia. Great plan. Abraham Lincoln, Henry Halleck aren't having it. Says, no, what we need you to do now that you've gotten such great work done in the Mississippi River Valley, you need to finish the job. And by finish the job, we mean finish the Trans-Mississippi. Wipe it out, take it over, and let's bring Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas back into the Union. You've got the troops to do it, let's do it. And what it'll look like is a multi-pronged advance, essentially like driving rabbits, driving deer through the woods. Just put a line of people, beat the brush, drive the Confederates ahead of you, and they will collapse. The Trans-Mississippi is almost done. Specifically, this is the Trans-Mississippi that they're wanting to have done. The Trans-Mississippi, after the summer of 63, has all the makings of essentially a rump confederacy, its own sort of nation within the larger separatist movement, which was the confederacy. And what it will be driven by is cotton. There is a huge amount of cotton resources that can be used for de facto currency, and it can also back up the credit and the financial system of that Trans-Mississippi Confederacy. So Lincoln says, let's collapse it. Now I'll point out a couple of key points here. One is Shreveport. It gets all the press for being the center of gravity of the Trans-Mississippi. It is certainly the center of gravity when it comes to military administration. But there's another center of gravity, Houston. Houston has a very large role to play in this Trans-Mississippi semi-nation in that it is the administrative and supply headquarters for the whole effort. Two centers of gravity, Shreveport and Houston. Number of uh, depots like Jefferson, Texas, which is attached by water to the Red River Valley, Red River Valley all the way into the heartland of Louisiana. You have other places that are pretty important like Eagle Pass, Laredo, Rio Grande City, and Matamoros. How often do you hear those names thrown out there as being important Civil War towns? But they are, because here how it work, here's how it works. Cotton gets harvested from places like Bonham and Rusk and Tyler. It's run down here to Austin, Allerton, or down to San Antonio and Victoria, and from there it goes into these Rio Grande ports. 
That's how you will finance the resistance to federal authority in this region. It's critical. Lincoln says, all right, while they are still forming, let's smother this baby in the crib. Grant says, well, do you want to win the war or do you want to smother babies? I mean... <laughs> so here's the great plan that is proposed. They've got a lot of troops. The idea is that Sherman will move from Vicksburg to Shreveport via Monroe. McPherson will go against Alexandria, and he'll do that from Natchez through the town of Trinity, Louisiana. From Trinity, you go on either side of the Catahoula Lake whenever it's got water in it, and you'll end up in Alex. Steele will move from Helena, take Little Rock. Hurlbut will move from Memphis, and he'll head, head into the heartland of southeastern Arkansas, which has, up to this point, been completely unscathed by war, for all intents and purposes. The fields there are loaded with cotton, loaded with corn. What Banks will do is he will send troops to occupy Point Coupee Parish. Now, Point Coupee Parish is False River. It's just across the river from... Um, uh, Bayou Sarah is just up from Baton Rouge. It's that West Bank country. If you occupy Point B P uh, Coupee, then you occupy a spot of land between the Shafalaya River and the Mississippi. Essentially, you're covering the West Bank. So we'll put some troops up there. From that flanking position, you can actually threaten Opelousas, which is almost due west. Meanwhile, you need some beaters pushing the Confederates ahead of you. Got two of them. One of them will be the 13th Corps, moving up Bayou Tesh from Brashear City. The other will be the 19th Corps, which by now has fallen from a high of about 30,000 men to about 5,000 men, because most of the regiments had been nine months volunteers. They've all gone home after Port Hudson. These guys will isolate the battlefield by dropping in on Beaumont. All right. All that sounds good. Here's what it looks like on a map. All those blue arrows are all the different moving parts. But you can see what the net effect will be. You will bottle up the Confederate Army of the Trans-Mississippi somewhere around Nacogdoches, if everything works correctly. And there they will just wither on the vine. You will take both the center of gravity in Shreveport and also the center of gravity in Houston in this process. So there's the objective. Take out Kirby Smith's Confederate Army. Ah, reconstruct Louisiana and Arkansas. What's that all about? Well, you need these states to rejoin the Union. And you need them to rejoin the Union for a very practical reason. Let me posit this for a moment. What happens if the Confederacy collapses prematurely. What if the Confederacy says, you know, this was a terrible idea, it's just a temper tantrum, we're done. Let's all be friends again. Guess what that will mean for the institution of slavery? All of a sudden, these former Confederate states may be readmitted as slave states, like Kentucky still is, like Missouri still is, like Maryland still is, like Delaware still is. And then, what has all this shooting and killing been about if this was about destroying slavery? So you have to go in there and reconstruct these states, not only so that they would be readmitted as free states, but also so that they can weigh in on a national statute which will outlaw slavery forever. That's a constitutional amendment. In this case, the 13th Amendment. So there's a political dimension here. The more of these states that you can bring in, the more heft you'll have on that lifting. You know, one of the states that's absolutely four square against the 13th Amendment is New York. Because they see that as a gross violation of property rights. So what you do is to, to offset New York in their hard-headed stance, you got to bring in a couple of puppet states, Arkansas and Louisiana, to get them to vote correctly. So there's an interesting motive there. Two centers of gravity we've discussed, but this is interesting. 
They also want to plant the flag in Texas. And oftentimes this is applied to the Red River campaign, but this phrase is actually applied for the first time in August 63. So if you're going to plant the flag in Texas to discourage the French, you don't do that in Shreveport. You do it in Texas. We'll get to that. And then while we're at it, let's reconstruct Texas. How hard can it be, right? <laughs> Here is what is on Lincoln and Halleck's mind. And this is why you need to plant the flag in Texas. This is the French naval vessel La Gloire, which is identical to its sister ship, Le Normandie. Le Normandie and a a fairly sizable French flotilla is in the western Gulf of Mexico. This is an ironclad frigate. This is the aircraft carrier of its day. What nobody believed could be done at that time was that you, they didn't think you could take an ironclad frigate and sail it successfully across the Atlantic. Well, there it is, off the coast of Tampico. And that ship by itself could completely handle the West Gulf Blockading Squadron. There's really no other ship in its class. So when we're talking about a French threat, we forget about that naval dimension. And here's how come the French are in the Western Gulf. Because they have come to intervene in a Mexican Civil War. Number one killer of Mexicans in the 19th century is Mexicans. And they fight civil wars on a regular rotation, coup and counter coup. But there was finally a civil war, La Guerra de la Reforma, that was really about principles instead of personalities. Big shift in Mexican history. And in this civil war, Benito Juarez, ends up becoming the victor, him and his liberal supporters. The conservatives that lose, the old centralist back in the days of the Alamo, lose to what would have been the federalist in the 1830s, and the conservatives are not having it. Said, look, Mexico needs some sort of strong man to run it. And where do they breed strong people? That would be Europe and their nobility. So they go over to Europe hunting for a monarch. Meanwhile, the French go, this would be a great opportunity to extend our influence into North America because we've had an interruption in our cotton supply and Mexico would make a great cotton kingdom and they're right next to the Confederacy and this might work out to their advantage as well. So the French are intrigued. They're shopping around for some foreign adventures. They looked at Korea, said, eh. They looked at Indochina and said, maybe. Then they looked at Mexico and said, that'll work. That'll work just fine. So the French decide to back the Mexican conservatives in trying to establish a European monarchy in Mexico. Now then, in 1862, the French try it and they get rebuffed on the 5th of May at the town of Puebla. Today we remember that as the Cinco de Mayo. So in the Cinco de Mayo, a ersatz Mexican army rebuffs a veteran French army in a stunning upset. But think about what's going on in the American Civil War on the 5th of May. New Orleans has fallen, but back east, you know, it's looking like the Union is not really doing so hot. I mean, it's all up in the air. It's anybody's guess on how this thing is going to go. Had the French taken Mexico City in May of 1862, you would have had a major European player at a very critical point, nearby, at a very critical point in the course of the American Civil War. So, the Cinco de Mayo was a big Civil War victory, in a way, for the Union cause. But in 63, the French come back, they make short work of the Mexican army that's arrayed before it, 
and they take Mexico City in the summer of 63. Well, what's the state of the war in the summer of 63? Gettysburg is done, Vicksburg is done, Port Hudson is done. The Confederacy has taken some pretty severe and I would argue mortal blows. Now it's just a question of finishing it off. Now the French intervention is desperate. Had they had that extra year, they would have had a French supported Mexican empire as a fait accompli. Now they're having to speed it up in order to get this done while the Union reorganizes its military might and addresses this international threat. So the clock is ticking. There's also some practical considerations. This big campaign in the Trans-Mississippi will clear the West Bank of the Mississippi, uh, get those electoral votes into the camp. I talked about that, 13th Amendment. But think about this. What if the French intervened and established a naval base in Galveston? Man, that changes everything. Now, have the French said they're going to do that? Of course not, because you don't tell everybody what you're planning. But in Lincoln's mind, in Halleck's mind, you know, this is something we have to consider. So somehow we need to make sure that the French understand that that real estate's not really up for grabs. So what could possibly go wrong? All right. You've got to coordinate really more than 100,000 troops across the largest longest front in American military history up to that time. Some would argue to the present day. The logistics of that territory is nightmarish, primarily because it's still pretty much wilderness and undeveloped. I mean, my gosh, they didn't break the raft in the Red River that created the conditions for establishing Shreveport until 1836. That's just a decade and a half before all this stuff. So we're talking about Louisiana is still a frontier. There's also a mandate to raise 100,000 black troops from the lower Mississippi River Valley, but this assumes that all of these recently emancipated people will be enthusiastic about that project, and not all, all of them are. They like the idea of being free, but they're not so keen on being free to be shot as cannon fodder. <laughs> the Rebs are highly mobile. That'll come into play. And here's the last one that people oftentimes forget in terms of military history. You're not operating in a vacuum. All right, so we'll come back to the vacuum. First thing you gotta do is see if it's feasible, and sure enough, Expeditions out of Helena, expeditions out of Vicksburg, expeditions out of Natchez, they are all showing, you know, the ways wide open. This can be a, a, a walkover. Tom Green's trying to figure out what's up. He takes his Texas cavalry into Point Coupee Parish to see if there's anybody in there. Nobody at that time, but he understands sooner or later the Federals are going to figure out that they're vulnerable here and they're going to put some troops right in this parish, and he's right. Down here in New Orleans, Heron is bringing up one division of the 13th Corps to occupy that zone. Down south, you've got Union positions at Brashear City, Thibodeau, Plaquemin, Donaldsonville, Baton Rouge, and Port Hudson. So they've almost got a nice iron wall that'll keep the Confederates from threatening New Orleans again. This is a, a result of the campaigns in the summer of 63. First things first is you got to get the road open to Alex. And the way you do that is you push, push east from Natchez. You take the little town of Trinity. Trinity is the junction of all the rivers that will lead you all the way up into Arkansas, all the way down to the Red River Valley. Covering Trinity is a small earthwork called Fort Beauregard. The Federals go up to Fort Beauregard, spike the guns, chase off the garrison in reverse order. They chased off the garrison, then spiked the guns. Uh, otherwise, it would have been a little difficult. But uh, <laughs> they do all that. 
And they say, all right, road's wide open. We can either go north of Catahoula Lake or south of Catahoula Lake, but we can get to Alexandria. The only thing blocking their route will be Walker's division. And they're taking up positions around White Sulphur Springs, Louisiana. In the middle of coordinating all these efforts, Ulysses Grant goes down to New Orleans to have a high-level conference with Nathaniel P. Banks. Grant's saying, all right, we're going here, 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 and here. You guys are going here and here, and then over there, and we're going to converge on three break. He actually inspects Banks' army at Camp Carrollton, which is present-day Audubon Park, New Orleans. It's the zoo. As you drive in towards the zoo and you see, oh man, these are great stately oaks, nice broad lawns. Yeah, there used to be a lot of federal troops camping there. Grant inspects the troops. He didn't bring his horse with him, so he borrows one from Banks. But as they are inspecting the troops and touring around, they have a three or five martini lunch. <laughs> and it's hot. And they start joshing around in the official military families, the staff and whatnot, and they get to talking about horses and who's got the best horse. And one of the staff officers challenges Ulysses Grant to a horse race back to headquarters. And Grant says, <clears throat> I'll show you who the better rider is. You're on. And they do a horse race through the streets of New Orleans. And in the process, Grant's horse falls on him, nearly kills him. Now when I tell this story in Louisiana, I have several people raise their hand at this point and they say, where'd that horse wreck happen? And I took them for serious. And I figured it out and it's actually there's a liquor store there now, <laughs> ironically enough. And I said, well why are you guys in Louisiana so interested in you know, this event? I said, well we'd like to raise a monument. And I said, really? I said, yeah, to the horse. <laughs> All right. What ends up happening with Grant is he is sidelined. I mean, it literally nearly kills him, so much so that there's a big cover up on exactly how badly injured he is. And this now leaves Nathaniel P. Banks as the ranking officer to coordinate this vast operation, and he has had really no significant contact with the northern elements of this massive campaign. So already they're off balance, but still we can isolate this battlefield and buy time, except that we can't. The Battle of Sabine Pass is now presented in context. This was supposed to be a great opportunity to cut off reinforcements from reaching Louisiana from Texas by putting a blocking force at Beaumont. But because there's 42 Irishmen from Houston who are pretty handy with a 32 pounder, they chase this campaign or this expedition off and knock out two gunboats in the process. So it's another stunning upset to Union plans. So Grant sideline, Sabine Pass means that the blocking force is now not in position and there is a military calamity to federal intentions in North Georgia. Remember how I said that they're, this whole expedition in Trans-Mississippi is not operating in a vacuum? Well, there's part of the suck right there. <laughs> and that is, remember that plan where Grant and Banks would bring their armies to converge with another Union army? The Federals didn't do it, but the Confederates did. And they sent reinforcements from the Army of Northern Virginia to the Army of Tennessee, and they nearly destroyed Rosecrans' army at the Battle of Chickamauga, which is stunning because the federal authorities, Lincoln, Halleck, and company, believed that they had this thing pretty much done. But there's still a lot of fight left in these Confederates. Well, while all that's shaping up in North Georgia, the campaign in the Trans-Mississippi is proceeding apace. And Banks is moving troops across Brashear City into the Lower Tesh 
comes up here to Generet, puts Heron's guys over here in Point Coupee, and they are moving on like it's all going according to plan. They had no idea that it was not. Green, meanwhile, has figured out, hmm, we need to keep an eye on things and keep them from cutting off this region by going due west. So here's what's going on. Keep that other stuff in the back of your head. <clears throat> All those troops that have been concentrated on the Mississippi get siphoned off. Big swaths of them. They're going to ultimately be part of Sherman's army in Georgia in 1864. So you can figure out that all of a sudden the ground has shifted underneath Nathaniel P. Banks and that northern element of this great Trans-Mississippi campaign is probably not going to happen. That's all he's got left and these guys have to perform a lot of garrison duty. Which then begs the question. Well, can I be relieved of some of my obligations, Mr. President? And the answer to that is, nope. You still got to do what I asked you to do. You just have to do it with a lot fewer troops. How, how hard can it be, Nathaniel? <laughs> so here's Banks' plan. He says, all right, if I've got to do all that, I'm not going to be able to take Shreveport because that's where the center, the, the center of mass is for the Confederate Army. They're between Alexandria and Lafayette. And, you know, I, I can either fight a big pitched battle with the entire combined army, Confederate Army, the Trans-Mississippi, or I can put, plant the flag in Texas and scare off the French. I can't really do both. So his plan is threaten Alexandria, threaten Houston, Keep the Confederate generals guessing. Meanwhile, plant the flag somewhere in Texas. How about where the French are? If you're going to plant the flag in Texas, it needs to be in a location that the French can see it. So he said, I'll keep them guessing in Louisiana. I will plant the flag over here at Brownsville. And I'll land at the future SpaceX port at Brazos Santiago. Because <laughs> that's what's down there now. All right. The French, meanwhile, are ooching north. That's a technical term. Uh, they're heading north. Juarez is on the run. He's running all the way over here to San Luis Potosi. He goes over here to Chihuahua. Ultimately, he will land in a town in the far northwestern part of the country that will forever, from that point on, be known as Juarez. So the liberal cause backed by the Lincoln administration is getting beat up and the French are looming. So Banks says, I'll handle it by putting small division of troops down there in Brownsville. Once I have brushed back the French, I will take advantage of the surprise I will have inflicted on the Confederate authorities to hopscotch my way up and capture Houston. If I can put a Union army in Houston, guess what these guys over here will be short of? Uniforms, ammunition, muskets, all the stuff that they're bringing in through the blockade through Mexico in exchange for cotton. So Houston is critical to cutting off the Trans-Mississippi supply line. This is Banks' plan. The idea is you got to keep them stuck in Louisiana and hopefully we'll get more reinforcements from back east. All right, there's some practical issues though. Louisiana is a tangle. It is tough country. If to understand Louisiana, you got to remember that there's this big creamy center in this sandwich <laughs> called the Chafalaya Basin. There is a green strip on this side and there's a green strip on that side. So there's two different areas that you have to think about. There's two ways to connect these two strips. That's Lyons Ferry over here near Brobridge, and there's Morgan's Ferry, which is next to Oblivion. 
Actually, that's a good town name for Louisiana, but. <laughs> Anyhow, it's in the middle of nowhere. In fact, uh, for the longest time, nobody knew exactly where Morgan's Ferry was, and I had to rediscover it for them. But there's two ways to cross this basin. So you can either go this way, or you can go this way. But if you do both of those simultaneously, you come together right here in the Opelousas, uh, Washington, Port Barry nexus. That really important sort of uh, combination of towns right there in South Louisiana. So that's the plan. The Federals start moving up by Utesh, and they will keep the Rebs on their side of the Shafalaya over here in Point Coupee Parish. So far, so good. Tom Green says, I want to know what's going on here, and if I can eliminate this thread here, then I can scooch this way, come in from behind, or that allow me to move my attention this direction and block this advance. What ends up happening will be the Battle of Sterling's Plantation, which I'll point to in a second. Meanwhile, let's take a look at this terrain. This is the Tesh, the Great Valley of the Tesh. The key to this is actually New Iberia and Vermilionville. If you can get up past New Iberia and Vermilionville, it is a straight shot to the left to get to Houston. The only thing between you and Houston is the number of rivers. The Mermintal, the Calcasieu being the two largest in Louisiana. Then you got the Sabine and then you got the Neches. So you're going to need some pontoon bridges. But it's flat, and it's a straight shot. So numbers will come into play. What Taylor is figuring on is, well, are they going to Houston, or are they going to Alex? Because he's pretty convinced they're going to Alex. So he concentrates his armies in this region, to where they can go east into Point Capi, or they can go south against the troops moving up by Utesh. It's a compl complicated conundrum. There's some more uh, numbers for you, because I know a bunch of you guys are numbered folks. Who's going where, how many they got, how many they opposed by. Well, there it is. And that's where they're going. One of the things that is helping to release a bunch of these Union troops is that they have raised a corps, the Corps d'Afrique, of emancipated black men. These are the guys that are busy redigging, rebuilding Port Hudson. They've filled in a bunch of the old trenches. They built a big redoubt out of Port Hudson, pointing the other direction, pointing down river. Uh, they've also got troops garrisoning in Natchez. They're raising troops down in South Louisiana. Uh, this is freeing up the other maneuver elements to move up by Utesh and into Point Capi. So again, this is what it looks like on the map. Advancing up by Utesh, and over here in Point Coupe, blocking. So Green says, all right, I'm going to jump that bunch in Point Coupe. And he does so by trying to eliminate Heron's division and take it off the table and out of the equation. If he can do that, then all of a sudden the federal right flank will be exposed, the grand right flank going up by Utesh. Here's a map of the Battle of Sterling's Plantation. It is a pretty tough country to get to. I'll give you a quick overview. Essentially, it's everybody go long. <laughs> the federal position, they have their main base at Morganza. They have an outpost over here at Sterling Plantation. Sugar cane intervening between the two. A long road that goes along uh, Bayou uh, Fordoche. The Confederates are going to cross at Morgan's Ferry and then try to isolate this small garrison, gobble it up. As these guys come to save them, gobble them up. That's the plan. Problem is, this battle begins in what I think may have been a very strong tropical depression or a Category 1 hurricane. And I've done this forensically going back into the Hurricane Prediction Center, and they said, oh, yeah, there was some terrible weather. And what tipped me off was that a coaling vessel, the Manahasset, had been driven ashore on the coast of Texas during that weekend. 
And I'm going, man, the only thing that's driving, driving boats onto the shore of Texas is a big tropical event. So then I tracked it and said, oh, yeah, it goes right over Point Coupee Parish. So it is really, really tough to pull off a kind of complicated plan like this in a driving rainstorm. A friend of mine talked about his 15th Texas uh, ancestor that was in this fight. He said, yeah, he's wounded twice. One of them, bullet went through his left arm or left hand into his shoulder. And I said, wow, that's a defensive wound. And he said, yeah, that's what it struck me as. And he says, well, it's because he didn't see the Yankee that shot at him until he was five feet away. Because it was driving rain and he had just come through a sugarcane field. Yeah, that was a close-in, brutal fight. At the end, Green does not capture this, but he does capture this. So he declares victory. They get back across Morgan's Ferry before they get stuck behind a rising river on the wrong side of it. So with that done, Green decides that these guys are probably chasing to the point that they will not be very energetic. He moves west, combines with other Confederate units that are moving down to get into position to oppose this advance, and the next thing you know, you have a series of skirmishes between Vermilionville all the way up to Opelousas. In this process, there's actually Texan on Texan violence. A lot of people in the Lone Star State do not realize that there are Texas Unionists that join the Union Army. There are. They scrap it out all the way up by Utesh. So the Louisiana part of this show was going well. The Federals, they've taken some licks, but they are driving the Confederates out of New Iberia, out of Vermilionville, which means that all they have to do is hook a left and they can get to Houston if need be. So you have options. You can go to Texas by sea or you can go to Texas over land since you've cleared this route. But they're not doing it at a rapid clip. 100 miles in three weeks is not a ferocious pace. Richard Taylor gets convinced that Alex is the target, so he digs in. There's actually an extensive line of Confederate fortifications, in case you're a relic hunter, somewhere between Washington, Louisiana, and uh, Cheneyville, in, right up along Bayou Buff. So here's what it looks like. We can get to Texas this way. We can get to Texas this way. You can get to Texas this way if you're dumb. I mean, getting to Texas via Shreveport makes absolutely no sense if your plan is to brush back the French. The drive continues in October, and finally the Confederates are driven all the way past Washington over here to uh, Moundville, and that line of fortifications, that defensive position is right up here at the top of this map. That's where Taylor is going to make his stand. That's where the big winner-take-all decisive engagement for Louisiana will occur in his estimation, near Holmesville. Meanwhile, Banks is making plans for part two of his campaign. The challenge is the coast of Texas is kind of crummy. It's not good for amphibious operations, but if you take a look at it, there's one great big bite out of the Texas coast that seems to be fairly navigable, and is home to its second largest port, Indianola. Matagorda Bay is the key. So brush the French back down here, somehow take Matagorda, and you've got Texas. The Confederates are flummoxed. Because one day they're facing the Federals, and the next day the Federals in Louisiana are gone. They send scouts out there, they say, all right, is Heron still at Morganza? No, he's gone. Well, what's going on down Bayou Tesh? Well, can't get past Washington, but they're not pushing towards Alexandria anymore. We don't know what's going on. Most telling, the 1st Texas Cavalry U.S. is withdrawn from its front line position, from its skirmishing position. Well, where could they be going? Then on November 1st, 
the troops that used to be in Point Coupee now land at Brownsville. So that's the route. They land down there at Brazos Santiago. Some of the Cordae Freak from Louisiana dig in, make that into a permanent base. That's the future launch pad they're putting together right there for Elon Musk. And the federal troops in Louisiana begin to collapse back to the south. The Confederates are going, well, if Alexandria is their target, why are they now retreating? So they have to go and probe the rear guard to see if they can take some prisoners and figure out what the plan is. And that results in the Battle of Bayou Bourbeau, which you guys saw. I've actually led some of you on a tour of that battlefield. It's an interesting little rear guard engagement, sort of like Sterling's Plantation. Once again, the Confederates were able to isolate and pretty much destroy a Union brigade. But they don't learn much. They don't really learn what the overall Union strategic intentions are. But then all of a sudden, gallopers come in from Texas saying, nah, we got Federals down in Brownsville. Well, Brownsville's almost like the other side of the moon, logistically. So it's like, well, this isn't really affecting us right here near Opelousas, but it is interesting intelligence. I wonder what they're thinking. Well, what they're thinking is, we got to get to Matagorda Bay. The key to Matagorda Bay is Fort Esperanza, the largest fortification in Texas, ironically named Fort Hope, like we hope we can hold it. <laughs> Which they can't. And the idea is to take this uh, barrier island, set up an Indianola, and then head into Matagorda Bay. That's a Civil War battlefield. That's a Civil War battlefield. That's the route that a lot of New England and Midwestern troops marched up to get to Matagorda Bay. This is it from space. You can see the old historic Pascavallo is here. They cut a different cut here. The Union had a huge encampment here. The fort is there. There's still earthworks that can be seen. I'm planning a, a boat and drone trip to go uh, capture that. Town of Siluria is here. You know, it gets wiped out by a hurricane after the Civil War, so there's, it's changed a bunch. But the Federals do take a position on Matagorda Bay. So what's heading, he, going on in Mexico? Well, the French are finding it tough going. They are not actually making the progress that they had been used to. The guerrillas have risen up, and they're really causing havoc with French logistics. So the French are not nearly as scary and not nearly as full of momentum as they had been. The Confederates all of a sudden are going, wait a second, if they're falling back in Louisiana, they're showing up in Texas, maybe it's always been Texas and they just fooled us, which is in fact what had happened. Richard Taylor got tricked. And Richard Taylor had his pet theory that they were going all the way to Shreveport via Alex, and he would not abandon it. And as he kept focusing on that theory, Banks actually stole a march on him and landed in Texas. So now that it's Texas, is it by land or by sea? There's pontoon boats in New Iberia. Hmm, maybe it's both. And then Taylor says, wait, if they're in Texas and they're in New Iberia, who's on the west bank of the Mississippi? And the answer to that would be, well, nobody. So he sends Walker's division on a one-month raid, chewing up the west bank of the Mississippi. He posts batteries all up and down the Mississippi, and he shells Union shipping. In fact, he smacks the uh, Black Hawk, uh, Steamboat Emerald, USS Signal, the Henry Von Fuhl. I mean, the Henry Von Fuhl is just carrying cargo, just regular old consumer goods from New Orleans all the way up to St. Louis. 
and they're chugging along, essentially the Mississippi River version of an 18-wheeler, and somebody starts putting six-pounder rounds through it. Actually kills a woman in the salon who was a Vermont school teacher sent down to educate recently freed emancipated children. So you can imagine what sort of headline this makes back east. Like, wait, we thought the Mississippi flowed unvexed to the sea. Well, that looks pretty vexing <laughs> to us. The Confederates, meanwhile, say, well, let's see if they're actually down here at Vermilionville or New Iberia. Leads to a number of skirmishes where they're trying to figure out Union intentions. And what the Confederates are figuring out is these Federals are not behaving very aggressively. So they have something to hide. In fact, they do. They're siphoning troops out of Louisiana to support this effort up the Texas coast. They throw together a Texas army, kind of from scratch, bits and pieces laying around. But the federal efforts at capturing Matagorda Bay puts them in a keen position to either move up the coast towards Houston, northwest out of Matagorda Bay to Victoria, maybe even to San Antonio. There's communication between that army on the Texas coast with the California command that has taken over Fort Lancaster on the Pecos in West Texas. They're poised to really cause some havoc in Texas. But when Grant gets appointed to run all the Union military efforts, he says, why are we in Texas? That's a complete distraction. There's a reason he's making these statements. Banks gets the word. Banks shows back up in New Orleans thinking that he's got a tiger by the tail. The world is his oyster. Whatever metaphor you would like, everything is going his direction. But when he gets back to New Orleans, his inbox is full of mail. And all of a sudden, the same guys that put him on this Texas task are saying, what are you doing in Texas? The same guys that put him on reconstructing Louisiana but did not interfere with the civilian process ask him how come he hasn't intervened in the civilian process. So his bosses are changing the rules on him. And he's like, what the heck? And then all of a sudden, get out of Texas. So he sends word to his guy in Texas, and Dana goes, what are you talking about? If you just send me two cavalry regiments, Houston's mine by Christmas, certainly by mid-January. And then everything you've hoped to accomplish will have been accomplished. And all of a sudden, the army in the Trans-Mississippi will wither. And Banks says, yeah, I understand that. But orders are orders. What none of these guys understood was that the Mexican guerrillas that were chewing up the French troops and their imperialist allies had caused the French to rethink their commitment to an empire in Mexico. They can also see how the war is progressing in the United States. So the French do a back-channel diplomatic reach to the Lincoln administration. They get together and they reach a detente in that if you don't intervene in our affairs in Mexico, Mr. Lincoln, we will promise not to interfere with your issues that you're facing. So now all of a sudden you don't need to plant the flag in Texas because the French have made their promises. That's what Grant knew. That's what Banks and Dana did not know. What Banks gets told is, you knucklehead, it's Shreveport. And he's going, Shreveport isn't in Texas. <laughs> well, we don't need you in Texas anymore. You know, it's, culturally, it is part of Texas. You're correct. <laughs> That's where they butter their rice. Let's be real. So what ends up happening in 1864 is all this gets unraveled and re-raveled in a different direction and all the Confederate reinforcements that have been rushed 
to Texas, including Tom Green's Cavalry Division from Louisiana. All this army that had been raised down here to oppose this invasion of Texas then becomes a ready reserve for the Confederate Army of the Trans-Mississippi to reinforce their commands and finally have the big, titanic battle for the Trans-Mississippi somewhere near Shreveport. That sets up the Red River Campaign. All right, but that book isn't ready yet. Scott has told me I am committed to do it, and I must do it before I die. And I'm afraid if I finish it, I'll just die. So <laughs> that's the only thing keeping me alive and sustaining me. I appreciate your attention for Tempest Over Texas. Thank you.